areas of interest is of course hematopathology with special interest in flow cytometry and that's why I'm here to just share, uh, share my flow cytometry experience and also to learn from you all. So with that, I request all of you to just mute yourself so that I don't have any disturbances. Make sure that you have you are in mute. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Tulsi Raman, you mute uh, everyone and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose uh, I suppose a lot of people have to mute themselves. No, no, you just press the mute everyone. Yeah, but as they log in again, it will be like, uh, yeah, I suppose it's been done. Okay, right. Right. So, so let's start with this. Uh, as we just circulated in the WhatsApp group, this would be the course content where we have a series of 11 lectures with three assessments. Okay, so we have lecture every week, Friday, 7 o'clock in the evening. So before we start, there was a question in the chat box like how long the session would go. The session may go from one to one and a half hours based on how we are moving and how many questions and how many interactions we are having. So it would be a solid one, one hour to one and a half hours because the last batch with the experience what I got, it may go up to one and a half hours. So that would be the duration of the session. And I request the participants certain things when you are coming into the session. Make sure you be on time. Uh, let's start at 7, 5 every week so that uh, we finish uh, on time. First, second is as I requested, kindly when you are logging in, please mute yourself so that uh, we don't have any chaos or confusion when we are going ahead. Third is, one thing what I observe is many participants, they feel like they can have a look of the recorded session in the classroom. Yes, that's possible, but I encourage you to come for the direct online sessions because very simple thing is that you can ask your questions and we can be more interactive. If you are seeing a recorded version, I may not be there to solve a query which may arise. So you, if you are directly attending the session, you can put your hands up and you can ask your question and you can solve there. So I request the participants to come and attend the session online rather than just going and uh, seeing a recorded video. You can do yeah. that too. But uh, attending an online session is much better. So I just request the participants again, uh, just mute yourself. Sir, you just take care of it now, sir. Please uh, mute the participants as they are coming in. So, yes, please mute. Okay. Fine. So, so this is the content. So today is the first lecture, and we'll be seeing about introduction to flow cytometry. We will be covering on basics. Of flow cytometer, flow cytometry, the applications and advancements in the field of flow cytometry. So this is for today's talk. So we have a series of other talks coming for every week. Uh, the second talk would be on instrumentation of flow cytometer, where we talk about the flow cytometer hardware and equipments. Third lecture is about fluorescence and fluoroprobes. After which you will have an assessment. Later, the fourth lecture will be on fluorescence spillover and compensation. Fifth lecture is on antibodies and panel designing. Lecture six is about sample processing and acquisition, where you will have a wet lab video demonstrating how the sample is processed for flow cytometry. Then we'll have a live data analysis, where I'll be showing you a live data analysis, how to uh, interpret a flow data. Then you have an assessment two of lecture four, five, six, and seven. Later, lecture eight, nine, ten is more about practicals, where we'll be seeing about live experiments with live analysis and assessment 3 will all be about giving a file and you need to analyze and give a report out of it. The 11th lecture is the most important one which is quality control and how do you need to report a flow cytometry, uh, how, how, how you need to give a flow cytometry report and what are the guidelines you need to follow. That will be the 11th lecture. So this is the design of this course. So before just get, getting into this uh, course, I just sent a survey link to the WhatsApp group. And I've got uh, considerable good replays from you all. So most of the people belong to clinical diagnostician group. So even I belong to that cohort. So that makes my job easy. 
there is no researcher so i will not be dealing much of research oriented topics here it's more about clinical uh, topics and clinical discussion and experience with flow cytometry it's like 50 50 50% have nil experience some people have experience with flow cytometry and others are uh, have, have just been as an observer so it's fine so uh, you can learn during the course and uh, the just a small question i asked is like what do you expect from this basic flow cytometry course uh, so there was a uh, many good answers like uh, basic uh, basics about flow cytometry compensation basic knowledge so this all and i'll take my sincere efforts and i'll do my best to cover up all these things and at the end of the course you will have a good knowledge about this uh, see uh, leukemia lymphoma may not be covered in this course this is a basic flow cytometry course to learn leukemia lymphoma first you need to know what is basics right so you should start knowing and doing simple assays uh, and then you can go for leukemia lymphoma of course leukemia lymphoma course will be coming up next month uh, that we let you know but this is a basic flow cytometry course and uh, i strongly say this course has to be done to understand advanced so leukemia lymphoma may not be covered per se in this module here it's more about topics which i said you uh, earlier okay and i also asked like what's the implications of flow cytometry practice in the in your future so again most of them are saying leukemia very ambitious answer so i am very happy about it uh, i wish you very good luck and i'm very sure that in future we will be definitely doing all these things so every master was once a beginner i wish you very good luck uh, i just want to share my experience like uh, it's been 9 years since i finished my post graduation and i've been practicing hematology hematopathology i was very interested in flow cytometry but i didn't get the chance initially it's been like 4 years of wait and then i finally got an opportunity to do flow and which i'm loving it and i'm enjoying it so definitely you all will definitely get a chance to do flow cytometry and this course will be a very good platform for you to do that i promise that so with no wastage of time we'll just go ahead so let's start flowing now the first question what i want to ask you is that why do you need a flow cytometer see we are all doing conventional microscopy we see the cells see its morphology we find what type of cell is that in fact that is the gold standard correct then why you need a sophisticated instrument like a flow cytometer to study the cells because flow microscopy has some disadvantages especially by microscopy you cannot count the cells correct you can just see the morphology but you cannot count the cells accurately one second it is very subjective what appears to be an activated or a reactive lymphocyte to be to you may appear like a blast to someone else so it is very very subjective okay third you cannot analyze large number of cells at the most how many cells can you see by microscopy or do a differential counting by microscopy 500 or at the most 1000 definitely not beyond that right so you cannot analyze a large number of cells so if you are not able to analyze large number of cells you will definitely not able to study some rare cells for example how many of you know that there are some circulating stem cells in the peripheral blood have you ever seen that in a microscope definitely not correct but when you use a flow cytometer you can study these rare circulating cells in metastatic carcinomas there are carcinoma cells which are circulating in the blood and that is the reason for metastasis can you see it by morphology by microscopy definitely not but with flow cytometry you can do so flow cytometry can able have the ability to analyze large number of cells study rare cells okay and beyond all that microscopy and manual techniques is very time consuming if you if i give you a hypocellular marrow and ask you to do a differential for 500 cells definitely you may take around 10 minutes correct but flow is isn't like that it is very fast so that are the, that are that that are the disadvantages of uh, microscopy and we need a special technique to overcome these disadvantages and there comes flow cytometry for a rescue now uh, to put the question the other way around okay now i'll give you an exercise or a challenge okay now i'm visually challenging you to tell me how many small red dots of three grades are there you have the smallest smaller and slightly larger can you able to tell me how many very small circles or uh, red circles or a medium red circles and large red circles are there in this plot visually you need to tell me 
would be able to do that? If I give you some time, possibly you may come up with some answer. I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but you'll be come, coming up with some answer. Okay, now, the parameter to differentiate these is only size. So it's all red in color and to differentiate this, you are using size as a parameter. Okay, so here the size is the parameter. Now I'm giving you another challenge like this. Here you have three different sizes, three or four different colors. Now again, if I visually challenge you, this is even more complex. Okay, and you need some special technique to do this because here two parameters are there. One is size, second is color. So if I challenge you how many small cells are red, green or yellow and how many big cells are red, green and yellow, definitely it's a very complex exercise and definitely visually you cannot do this. Okay, because here two things are there, size and color both matters. Whereas the previous one challenge what I give you was dealing only with size. So what is this color? I'll let you know later. But what is flow cytometry basically? Flow cytometer, as the name says, flow plus cyto plus meter. Okay. So you are measuring or studying the cells in a flowing state across a light path. It's called flow cytometry. Flow is flowing. That is the cells are in a flowing stream. Cyto means cell and meter means measuring. So measuring the cell in a flowing stream is called simply flow cytometer. That is a very, very simple definition for a flow cytometer. Okay. So you have a light source and you are studying the cells in a flowing stream and you are measuring them. So flow cytometer. Clear? Uh, to everyone of you, if you have any doubts, you can just raise your hands or you can just post your questions in the chat box. There will be a point where I stop and just check the chat box for questions and then I'll go ahead. Okay? You can push your questions on the chat box and I'll happy to take it anytime. Thanks. So, the advantage of flow cytometry is that it has the ability to discriminate, quantify and sort distinct population of cells at a rapid pace. So, it can discriminate cells. For example, it can discriminate lymphocytes, it can discriminate neutrophils, monocytes or any cells of your body. It can able to discriminate them, it can able to quantify them and it can sort. Sort in the sense it can separate those cells. Okay? Any distinct population of cells at a rapid pace. That is the beauty of flow cytometry. Now how this is done? It is done by two things. One is by the physical properties of the cell. What is physical property of the cell? Basically the size of the cell and the internal complexity of the cell. So I deal it in a, uh, much more briefly uh, in the upcoming slides. So physical property is basically the size of the cell. For example, lymphocyte is smaller, correct? Neutrophil is bigger, monocyte is even bigger. So I can able to discriminate these cells by the size. And the other way is like by internal complexity. For example, lymphocyte doesn't have any granules, whereas neutrophil has granules. So I can able to discriminate neutrophil and lymphocyte based on the internal granules. So that is the other way of doing it. The one more important way to discriminate the cells is by antigens or proteins. Now, for example, if it is neutrophil and lymphocyte, the physical properties will help help that is the size and the internal complexity now i want to discriminate type of types of lymphocyte for example b lymphocyte and t lymphocyte now both b lymphocyte and t lymphocyte may be appearing similar so physical properties will not help now i need to use an another technique to discriminate these two cells that is to differentiate b lymphocytes and t lymphocytes for that i will be using something called antigens and proteins present on the cell okay so I'll elaborate it in the subsequent slides. So the, so the so flow cytometry discriminates the cell based on the physical properties and antigens or proteins present in the cell. Okay. So how fast does uh, flow cytometry do this? It is very fast. Just think it, it can discriminate and analyze cells at a pace of around 10,000 to 1 lakh cells per second. It is so fast. It can analyze cells at a rate of 10,000 to 1 lakh cells per second. It is so fast. Whereas, it is nowhere, no technique comes near to this. Okay. Now, if you just quickly see the history of flow cytometry, uh, flow cytometry, how it came into practice and uh, uh, how it came into analysis. 
first of all it was moldovan who just counted cells based on suspending the cells through a capillary tube so what he did is he just suspended the cell in a fluid stream across a capillary tube and he was counting the cells okay so this was the first thing this was a basic flow cytometry technique like where you count the cells on a flowing stream correct then it was balas kulter where a very very important uh, uh, discovery happened where he used impedance technique to count the cells currently we all use cell counters in our laboratory where this is the technique which is used which is called the impedance technique okay the third important breakthrough happened when they used kulter principle or the impedance principle to sort the cells for example sorting the cells means separating the cells of interest uh, if you have a blood sample collecting neutrophils separately collecting the lymphocytes separately collecting the monocytes separately this is called sorting sorting is collecting the cells of interest okay the next thing happened is this is the actual major breakthrough which happened and this is the initial starting point of currently used flow cytometers where wolfgang and gode introduced fluorescence into flow cytometry okay here it was all basically for cell counting but this is the one which introduced fluorescence where apart from counting we were able to analyze and discriminate different different types of cells by fluorescence okay and using now again this fluorescence they were sorting cells which developed in 1970s and this kind of thing is called fluorescent assisted cell sorting okay so this is about a small brief uh, thing about the history of flow cytometer and how uh, the flow cytometer came into existence so this is a very old flow cytometer you see the size of the flow cytometer it was occupying an entire room you have these many compartments of flow cytometer each doing its own function and these all together gives you the data for analysis okay and you see the dis histogram display so this was almost occupying a room okay but now if you see how the flow cytometer has evolved and by technology now the flow cytometer is almost this much a small bench top instrument this is a beckman kulter instrument which is a 13 color instrument okay so almost occupying a small area in the bench so from that particular big flow cytometer occupying an entire room it has almost transformed to a very small bench top machine that is how technology has evolved and flow cytometry has evolved in types okay so what i mean by this 13 color everything see this is a very introductory class so certain terms what i am using may not be very clear to you there is no panic it all will be cleared during your subsequent sessions on the subsequent uh, uh, slides of this lecture so don't worry if you still have doubts you can ask me at the end of this lecture i would love to take okay now this is a out, uh, just an outline or a small map showing how a flow cytometer uh, flow cytometer works in a very very uh, basic format okay now for a for doing an analysis in flow cytometer the basic first requisite is the sample has to be in a suspension that means the cell has to be in a liquid suspended form the cell has to be in a liquid suspended form you cannot analyze solid tissues in flow cytometer in that manner if it's a solid tissue also you need to disintegrate the cells into single suspension and then you can analyze in flow cytometer okay so the first requisite is the cells has to be in a suspension that is it's a, it has to be suspended in a fluid or a liquid stream okay in a liquid medium okay so the cell suspension then it is passed through a capillary tube it is passed through a capillary tube okay the second requisite for flow cytometer is that when the cells are getting passed through a capillary tube or a flow nozzle anything it has to pass one after the other in a single file pattern you cannot allow the cells to pass in clusters okay so the rule number 2 is the cells has to pass through in a single file pattern that is one after the other why because a cell will be analyzed with the light source okay this light source is a in common conventional flow cytometers the light source is nothing but a laser okay so this light source will go and hit the cell okay now if the cell is not there the light source will directly go and hit the photo beam 
and you have a clock light. When the cell comes in between the photodiode, that is the detector and the light source, there is an interruption in the passage of light, correct? So when the cell is not there, the light passes from the light source or the from the laser to the detector and you get a flat line like this. When a cell comes in between, there is a breakage in the light pathway. When that occurs, you get a signal. Okay. So this size of the signal is proportional to the size of the cell. For example, if the cell size is larger, then you get a larger signal. If the cell size is smaller, you get a smaller signal. Okay. So the cell has to pass one after the other and a signal is generated when it is coming in between the detector and the light source. This is the principle, I mean basic out layer of the flow cytometer. Flow cytometer. Okay. Now why I said like the cell should pass in a single file is that for example, you assume that two cells are struck together and they are passing through the light source. Now, since the two cells are struck together, the signal generated will be bigger in size, correct? Because two cells are struck together. So, the amount of time the cells I mean, uh, in the passage between the light is more, correct? So, the amount of light which will be stopped hitting the detector will be more, correct? So, you get a larger signal, which is wrong. That is, so you interpret that the cell is larger in size. It is not true. It is basically because two cells are struck together. That is why it is giving a larger signal, which is wrong. So you cannot study the cell completely when if it is not moving in single file fashion. Okay. So I make it very simple. The first requisite for flow cytometry is that the cell has to be suspended in a fluid or a liquid medium. Second, when it is going across a light source, it has to be in a single file pattern, one after the other. If two or three cells are going at the same time, you, get, you will not be able to study the cell, one single cell at a time. It will give you false signal. Okay, so flow cytometer is not very new to us. We are using cell counters in our laboratory, which is almost has a similarity with flow cytometer. In what sense? See, how does the cell counter work? You have an electric current between the positive and the negative charge. And whenever the cell passes through an aperture, which is like this, there's a break in the electric current and it will be counted as a signal. Correct? This is almost like, again here cells are suspended in a fluid medium and again it is passing through an aperture and there's a break in electric current, which is generated as signal. So this is not exact flow cytometry, but very similar to a technique what we use in flow cytometry. So cell counters are somewhere like a common man's flow cytometry. Okay, based on the size, which is the signal generated, we differentiate the cells as RBCs, WBCs and platelets. Platelets are very small in size, followed by RBCs and then WBCs. Even WBCs, by size, we can discriminate them into lymphocyte, neutrophils and others. Correct? That's how a three-part cell counter works. And if you want to expand it to a five-part cell counter, then you need to use something called scatters. Okay, we'll see that. So, impedance is a technology where we are just seeing the size of the cell. Now, as I told you, count by physical properties. If you see a smaller size that is from 3 micrometer to say 20 micrometer, whatever events are counted in the cell counter, it will be taken as platelets. And from 50 micrometer to 100 in the RBC chamber will be counted as RBCs. And similarly, in WBCs, you have counting. But of course, by size alone, you cannot do exact differentiation between certain populations. For example, uh, eosinophil, monocyte, and basophil. That's why these three parameters are together given as others in three part cell counters. Whereas, if you use scatter properties, okay, what is scatter properties? Because scatter properties are based on the cell's internal complexity. Okay, now for example, you take lymphocyte. Lymphocyte doesn't have any granules in the cell, so it has very low side scatter. Now, the x-axis is side scatter. If you take lymphocytes, the lymphocyte doesn't have any granules, so it has a very low side scatter compared to monocytes. Monocytes have some amount of granules, so they show slightly higher side scatter compared to lymphocytes. If you take neutrophils, neutrophils have a lot of acidophilic granules, so it has higher side scatter than monocytes and lymphocytes, so it falls here. 
and finally eosinophils they have very large coarse granules and it has the highest of site scatter compared to neutrophils monocytes and lymphocytes now the five part cell counter for to differentiate the wbcs use this technology which is scatter properties so ba based on this you can differentiate lymphocytes monocytes neutrophils basophils and eosinophils so the simple cell counter what we are using is discriminating the cells only by physical properties as i sh showed you it discriminates cells based on size by impedance technology and discriminates wbcs uh, into five by, into five differentials by the scatter properties so this is how a cell counter works now is that sufficient for you as i said earlier this may not be sufficient see this is sufficient the cell counter is sufficient for you to study the major cell types of your blood but will it be sufficient to study the types of lymphocytes the types of monocytes the types of uh, other cells it may not be sufficient for example it, it will not be able to discriminate a t lymphocyte and a b lymphocyte okay and our immune system is very complex it is not as simple as that for example if you just take a t lymphocyte a t lymphocyte is a lymphocyte is divided into b lymphocyte and t lymphocyte the t lymphocyte is further divided into cytotoxic t lymphocyte and cd4 positive helper t lymphocyte the helper t lymphocytes are further divided into naive effector memory central memory tembra cells t regulatory cells so it is so diverse so diverse if you take monocytes monocytes have classical monocytes intermediate monocytes non classical monocytes and so on so on. so these all will not be given by your cell counter and that is the need why you need more advanced technology which can discriminate physical properties as well as additional properties as i said you before what is that the antigenic properties or proteins exploring the proteins present on the cell discriminating the cells based on the proteins or antigens present on the cell so that is the beauty of flow cytometry where it studies cells based on its physical properties as well as the proteins or antigens present on the cell how it is exploring that or how it is using that i'll show you now as i said you now we have two cells okay we have a t lymphocyte and b lymphocyte by physical properties this the, these two doesn't vary much because both are by morphology appears like a lymphocyte they have low forward scatter or low forward size say similar size and they have very low size scatter because they don't have any granules but still if i want to differentiate these two cells or i want to study these two cells separately i need to explore both the antigenic properties or the proteins present on the cell for example t cell have a antigen called cd3 it has an antigen called cd2 which is present only on the t and n k cells okay especially cd3 is present only on the t cells and similarly for b cells we have cd19 cd20 22 these are seen only in the b lineage cells so now i need to explore these antigenic properties to study only the b cells or only the t cells or discriminate b and t cells so how do we do this now in addition to the physical properties which is basically the size and the internal complexity of the granularity we wanted to explore the antigenic properties of the cell to further subtype it leave about normal human cells T lymphocyte, B lymphocytes, whatever I said you. If you want to study some cancerous cells or a malignant cells, and you want to check whether the cancerous cells are present in the blood, all you need, all you need to, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, I request the participants to mute themselves so that I don't have any uh, disturbance. So. Okay. Okay. Right. Do we have any doubts still now? Any doubts still now? You can post it in the chat box. I don't see any questions in the uh, chat box. Any doubts you can post till now, whatever we completed. Is there any doubts now? Can I go ahead? No doubt, it's perfect. So we can go ahead. Thank you. Fine. So as I said, you.
now i want to uh, leave about the normal cells which is present in the body now i want to see whether a patient has malignant cells in the body now all i need to know is to know what are the antigens which are not present in the malignant cells for example uh, let's see a cancerous cells cancer cells will express hepcam p r e p4 right now i want to check whether any circulating cancer cells are there in the blood what i need to know is that what i need to do is that i need to use an antibody against this antigen which is hepcam and with that i can able to detect these cells so any abnormal cells i can able to detect with flow cytometry by with the knowledge of antigenic properties present on the cell if i know the antigens which is there in that cell and if i have the reagents for that i can able to detect that cell that is the advantage of flow cytometry okay so how this is done i'll show you now what is the basic mechanism how this is done now we have a sample say for example a blood sample with cells okay now i need to label it with a fluorescent marker for example now let's take this is a uh, t lymphocyte okay the cell is a t lymphocyte and i in my experiment i want to study the t cells now okay i said you that one exclusive marker for t cell is the cd3 okay this cd everything i'll be discussing in antibodies okay so that's what i'm making if you are not understanding anything don't get panic this is a, just a basic course so i may use some terms which may not be familiar once we go for the subsequent lectures you will understand it okay now this cd uh, this t cell has a cd3 molecule and in my experiment i want to study only the t cells i'm not worried about the b lymphocytes neutrophils monocytes i'm not worried i want to study only the t cells or i want to discriminate the t cells from other blood cells now what i'm going to do is that i'm going to label the cells with a fluorescent marker which is conjugated with the i'm i'm going to label it with a fluorescent marker what is it like i'm using an antibody that is anti cd3 which is tagged to a fluorochrome okay now if i'm going to add this anti cd3 tagged to a fluorochrome this anti cd3 will come and bind only to t cells correct it will not bind to other cells of the it will not bind to other blood cells it will bind only to the t lymphocytes so after it is binding the cell moves in a linear stream across a focus light source as i showed you in the photograph okay now this cell with the the cell with the antigen bound to the antibody tagged to a fluorochrome will pass through a light source okay now two things will happen one is the, one is that when a when the light source hit the cell when it is passing through a fluid stream okay based on the cell size and internal complexity the light source when the light beam when it hits the cell it scatters correct the light beam is from the laser it is passing in a straight line when this cell comes in the path of the light the light gets scattered correct so now this scattered light gets detected so this scattered light is of two types one is the forward scatter and other is the side scatter which i'll show you for now you remember that the light gets scattered and this scattered light is captured by the detectors and this light signal is converted to electric signal okay this is one thing so basically this this scatter is to measure the physical property of the cell that is size and internal complexity or internal granularity so this is one thing which is happening what is the other thing happening is the same cell when it is passing through the uh, passing in a fluid stream and when it is hit by the laser light stream this fluorescent molecules get excited okay this fluorescent marker gets excited and it emits light which is called emission light okay now this emitted light is detected and again that light is converted to electric signal see this will happen only when the antibody tagged to a fluorochrome is attached to the cell for example if there is a b lymphocyte where it doesn't have this cd3 molecule so this antibody will not bind to b lymphocytes correct so when such a b cell is moving through the light source what happens it will not be excited the laser will not excite the fluorochrome since it is not attached so you will not get the signal only t cells when they are moving through it the fluorochrome get excited and you will get the signal and that's how you detect the t cells and discriminated from other blood cells okay so this is what two things which happens in the flow cytometer okay one is scatter properties which will tell you the idea about the physical properties of the cell and second is a fluorescent
property, I mean the fluorescent signal which tells you about the antigens which are present in the cell. Okay, now, so this is just a uh, basic uh, schematic diagram of a flow cytometer where you have a sheath fluid. I will explain you during the second class what is a sheath fluid. So you have a cells, okay, a, a cluster of, I mean, uh, a different combination of cells and when it passes through the flow cytometer, as I said you, two things is important. The cells has to be in a fluid suspension and it has to pass in a single file pattern when, it's in, when it is interrogating with the light source. The light source commonly used in conventional flow cytometers is laser. So I will be using these terms interchangeably. I may use laser or I may use light source. Both the same. Okay. So when the laser beam is hit, when the cell when the cell is hit by the laser beam, two things happen. One is scatter. When this light hits the cell, scatter happens. When the light is scattered, right? So the forward and side scatter light is detected. So that will give you about the size and the internal complexity of the or granularity of the cell. The second thing which happens is that fluorescence. If the cell is stuck to a fluorochrome, the fluorochrome gets excited and it emits light of a different wavelength which will be captured. The fluorescence emitted from the stain cells will be detected. So two things happen simultaneously. Okay. So two parameters are studied. One is fluorescent and the other is scatter properties. And these two are recorded from each cell. See, you have so many cells. For each cell, these two are recorded. The scatter properties, that is forward scatter and side scatter. And fluorescence is recorded for each cell which passes through the light source. Okay? Now, what is scatter? We'll discuss in detail about scatter and fluorescence now. Okay? Now, what is scatter? So, as I said, when there is a cell and when it's interrogated by a laser beam, two things happen. One is a forward scatter. That is in the same direction of the light source. Scatter happening in the same direction of the light source. Here in this case, this is the forward scatter. So light hits and it gets scattered like this. Okay, in all, all directions it will scatter. Forward scatter is the scatter which happens in the direction of the light source. Okay, this is called forward scatter. Now, very simple, the forward scatter gives an idea about the size of the cell, correct? If you have a small cell, the forward scatter will be less. If you have a larger cell, the forward scatter will be more. So the forward scatter gives you about the idea about the size of the cell. So forward scatter is equal to gives an idea about the size of the cell. The second scatter which happens is the scatter which happens in a perpendicular fashion. This is in parallel to the light source, correct? And the second scatter is perpendicular to the light source which is called side scatter. Now this side scatter will give you an idea about the granularity or the internal complexity of the cell. For example, if the cell is highly granular, for example, chromalocytes, the side scatter will be very high or the side scatter will be more. For neutrophils, again, side scatter will be more, but less than that of a eosinophil. Okay. For lymphocytes, the side scatter will be very less because the lymphocyte lacks granularity. Okay. So the side scatter, and for example, it's not just granularity. If the cell is vacuolated, even that will be taken as a internal complexity and such cells will have high side scatter. Okay. So to make it very simple, forward scatter is equal to size of the cell and side scatter is about the internal complexity or granularity of the cell. Okay. So these two things happen. This is called scatter. So let's see this. Now this is a neutrophil. Okay. And this is the laser source. When it is hit by the laser source, what happens to the forward scatter and side scatter? Neutrophils has granules. So it has a high side scatter and the size of the cell is also slightly larger compared to the lymphocytes. So it has a medium forward scatter. So the plot line, the population lies here. Okay. When you take lymphocyte, no granularity. So it has very low side scatter and even the size is smaller than neutrophils. So it has low forward scatter. So it, the population lies here. Take in case monocytes. The cell is larger than neutrophils. So it has a higher forward scatter. But the granularity is slightly higher than lymphocyte, but lower than neutrophil. So it falls in between the neutrophil side scatter and lymphocyte side scatter. So somewhere here. Okay. So that is how scatter happens. And when you accumulate all the three populations together with respect to forward scatter and side scatter, you get a data like this. Okay. This is forward scatter, which will tell you about the size. And this is side scatter, which tells you about the internal complexity or granularity. So lymphocytes have very low forward scatter 
and side scatter because they are smaller in size and also has no granules. If you take monocytes, monocytes are larger cells, so they are higher forward scatter compared to lymphocytes and neutrophils. But the side scatter is in between that of a granulocyte that is neutrophil and lymphocyte. Neutrophils or granulocyte, since they have azerophilic granules, they are higher side scatter compared to monocytes and lymphocytes. Okay, whereas forward scatter, the cells are medium. It is larger than lymphocyte, but smaller than, slightly smaller than monocyte, so it falls here. Okay. If, see, if you have a very large blast, a granular blast, okay, a lymphoblast, possibly that may fall somewhere here because size is larger, but there is no granule, so it may fall in this particular position. You are understanding? You are able to follow, right? Yeah. So, again, I'm just reading, these are all very basic concepts, so I'm taking some time to make this very clear for you so this is forward scatter so you have the laser beam here okay and this is the cell so forward scatter is something like the scattered light in the axis of light or in the direction of light okay it will be detected by a forward scatter detector so the amount of light scattered in forward direction is along the same axis of that of laser light is traveling that is called forward scatter the intensity of forward scatter is proportional to the size or diameter of the cell or particle that is being analyzed clear so as simple as it larger the cell higher the forward scatter smaller the cell lower the forward scatter clear see this is again a small uh, a diagrammatic representation see whenever this is the laser beam which is passing through and this is the cell in suspension fall, falling in a single file pattern and whenever the laser beam interrogates with the cell you find the scatter happening in the forward direction. And when this is happening, you get a pulse generated like this. If you have a larger cell, then the pulse generated may be larger. Smaller cell, smaller pulse. So that will give you proportionally the size of the cells. Clear? Now what is side scatter? See, forward scatter is the same axis of light. Right? Same direction of the light. Side scatter is in the perpendicular direction. Okay, now when the laser beam hits the cell, some amount of light will be deflected in a perpendicular direction. This light will tell you details about the internal complexity or the internal structures of the cell. Basically, the granules and vacuoles and so on. Okay, and these get collected in the detector called as side scatter detector. Okay, so the amount of light scattered to the perpendicular to the axis of laser light is traveling is called side scatter. The intensity of side scatter is proportional to the internal granularity of the cells or particles. It can be granularity, it can be vacuolations or any complexity. Okay, so this is as I already showed you, this is how the data looks like. So you have lymphocyte which has lower forward scatter and side scatter. You have monocytes which has a higher forward scatter compared to neutrophils and lymphocytes but lower side scatter because of less granules and neutrophils. Neutrophils are very high side scatter, but the size is slightly smaller than that of monocytes, hence slightly lower forward scatter. Now, what is this? Anyone want to attempt? Anybody wants to attempt? Perfect. It's debris. Okay. Yeah, it, it can be RBC. So, it's flow cytometry when I'm saying a granulocyte assay and I'm using the word debris, it means. I mean, uh, I mean, listen carefully, when, when I am doing a granulocyte assay or a WBC assay or a leukocyte assay and when I am calling them debris, it means it is RBCs or platelets or some other things which I am not interested on. It is, as rightly said, it is debris. Okay? Correct. So, FSE and SSE, internal so a correlated measurement between them can allow differentiation of cell types in heterogeneous cell population. So, uh, if it's a blood sample, this is neutrophils or granulocytes, this is monocytes, this is lymphocytes. This is debris where you have your platelets, RBCs, etc. If you have a blast, because of its high forward scatter, it can fall here. If you have promolocytes, it can fall somewhere here. Okay? So, based on that, you need to analyze the population. Okay? So, lymphocytes, monocytes, neutrophil, as you rightly said, debris, RBCs, debris, cells and platelets. Okay, similarly, now the same thing. So, lymphocytes falls here. Okay, monocytes falls here. This is neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, 
debris and some RBCs. Okay. Now I stop here. I want to take any questions you have. Uh, any questions? Sir, could you... Uh, okay. Sir, what is the number on x-axis donate? I'll tell you that. Uh, sir, could you enable my screen sharing, please? I suppose... Uh, it is basically a measurement. Something like a scale. So, it will tell you about the size of the sales and so on and so on. It's just, uh, it's just like a scale. So you need not worry much about it. Okay. When I'm discussing about analysis, I will tell about the different types of scales, a logical scale, logarithmic scale. But now you just say it is a scale. Scale is something like for measurement, right? What we use is something like a scale. So don't, uh, uh, so if it is higher the scale, greater is the signal, as simple as that. So now uh, beyond that, I don't want to go much deeper into that. Because during analysis, I'll be telling you what is scale, different types of scale, log scale, logarithmic scale, by exponential scale, all these things are there. But now, a scale is something but is something like your uh, measurement scale, as simple as nothing beyond that. So, uh, where do we see base of this? Okay. Now, in forward scatter, side scatter, uh, it's very, very difficult for you to see base of this. Now, I am discussing only with forward scatter side, side scatter signals. So base of is normally overlap with your neutrophil population. Okay. Because I have not gone into fluorescence. I am just discussing about the scatter properties. With scatter properties, you cannot able to differentiate much of uh, base of is from uh, neutrophils or uh, eosinophils. The three distinct population what you can discriminate by forward scatter and side scatter is neutrophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes. Even eosinophils, sometimes you can, but not very sure by forward scatter, side scatter. Okay, basophils you can discriminate when you add a marker like CD45 or CD123. You add that, then you can able to discriminate basophils. Okay, I'll show you that. But in forward scatter, side scatter, basophils not possible. And that's why in your five part cell counter, basophils they use a spe special reagent to discriminate to count them and. Uh, get the, uh, to uh, detect them. Even in your scattergram, you may not be able to see the base of it along with uh, neutrophil, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, etc. Is that okay, Dr. Preeti? Any other doubts? Yes, sir. Perfect. Any other doubt? Come on, you be as uh, casual as you can. You ask whatever doubts you have. No problem. Let it be so basic or low, so stupid, whatever you feel like. You just throw your questions. I'll try to explain so that you should not have any uh, inhibition here. We are all here to learn. So I'm there for you. And any doubts you have, let me tell you this also. Any doubts you have, immaterial of this class or any time you get a doubt, you push, push me a WhatsApp message. As a private message, you can push. Whenever I find time, I'll reply to you. And uh, I suppose you can get clarified. Or you have a difficult case where you want my assistance or some uh, opinion, I can able to give you also. I, I'm always there to help you. So don't think what people will think. You ask all your basic. I know this is a very, very new batch who doesn't have much experience with flow cytometry. So there is no harm in asking basic doubts. You, have, you ask whatever doubts you, have, you feel like. I'm ready to explain it. Till now, is it clear? Scatter properties, okay. Now I'm going to fluorescence. So I told you like flow cytometer, will analyze cells based on two things. One is physical properties. Physical properties is size and internal complexity. Okay. And second is fluorescence. Now I'm going into fluorescence. Till now it's clear. Any doubt? So I'll go ahead. Thank you. If you have any doubts, please put it in the chat box. I would love to take them. Okay. Thanks. Now, so as I said, Physical properties is done. So we are studying the size by forward scatter and internal complexity or granularity by side scatter. So that will be helpful for discriminating cells when they are of different sizes or by differs by internal complexity. Now, given that you want to discriminate and study cells which are of 
same physical features. For example, you want to study B cells or B lymphocytes. Now you need to discriminate them from T lymphocytes and K cells which are all morphologically same. Or to put it otherwise, they are by physical properties, these are all look alike. Now, if you want to study these cells, you need to bring in the extra property, which is antigenic properties or proteins present in the cells. And how could you do this? You can do this by fluorescence. Now, let me give you an example. Now, you have this lymphocyte or a target cell. Now, let's assume that this is a B lymphocyte, okay? B for bombing, okay? B lymphocyte. Now, I said to you, does this B lymphocyte by physical properties, you cannot discriminate them from T lymphocytes. So now you need to use their antigenic properties. Now B lymphocytes has an antigen called CD19, which is exclusively present only in B cells. So now I'm going to use this particular antigen to study the B cells. Now how, how am I going to do this? Now this CD19 antigen, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use an anti-CD19 antibody, which is tagged to a fluorochrome. What is a fluorochrome? All this detailed lecture will be on lecture 3. But for now, a fluorochrome is a material which absorbs light of a different wavelength and emits light of a different wavelength. Okay? A fluorochrome is a substance which absorbs light of a wavelength and emits light of a different wavelength. Fluorescence is not nothing uh, new to us, right? We would have seen this fluorescent paints or this uh, fluorescent stickers struck on the ceiling of the bedrooms and these all childhood activities would have done. It is very similar to this. So, they absorb light day, I mean light uh, during the daytime and they emit light at, of, uh, at, uh, at a different wavelength. Very simple. So, now I am using this anti-CD19 antibody which is tagged to a fluorochrome. So, when I am doing this, this anti-CD19 selectively binds only to CD19 antigen. It will not go and bind to other antigens present in non-B cells, okay? So, this goes and selectively binds to CD19 antigen and when this cell, this is called staining in flow cytometer. This is called staining in flow cytometer, okay? What is staining? Staining is adding an antibody tagged to a fluorochrome so that it binds to target cell of interest, okay? Now, this stained cell, when it is processed in flow cytometer or run in flow cytometer, what happens? It goes through and it is hit by a laser beam. Correct? So, as we saw, the laser beam will hit the cell and the physical properties by forward scatter and side scatter will be studied. Simultaneously, the laser light will also hit the fluorochrome to which the antibody is there. Okay? Now, this particular fluorochrome get excited. It gets excited and it emits light of a different wavelength. For example, here the excitation light is blue in color and the emitted light is green in color. Now, this emitted green light will be detected by a detector and it will be given as a signal. So, only when there is a B lymphocyte, you get a signal. When the next cell which passes through the laser beam is a T cell, this particular antibody will not get bind to that big T cell and you will not get signal. Only when the B cell passes through the laser beam, you get a signal. And that's how you study and discriminate B cells from T cells and all other cells. Only when the B cell passes through, you get the signal and any other cell apart from B cell passes through, you will not get the signal. And that's how you study the B cells in this experiment. Okay. And this is how fluorescence helps you to detect such cells. Okay. Now, any cell, you can simultaneously study up to as many antigens as possible. Okay, if the cell is having, now I showed you for a uh, schematic representation only one antigen. For example, this cell can be characterized by five or six antigens. You can stain the cell with five or six antibodies simultaneously and all them can be studied in that single cell at given point of time. Understood? See, I have, here I have used one, two, three, four, five. Five antigens uh, are being ex explored and five antibodies have been used and all of them are studied at a single in a single cell at a given point of time okay this this is what color means i'll explain you in the next image okay so this is called fluorescence okay now a small thing about the fluorochrome as i said you what are fluorochrome or fluorophore is that they get excited from uh, of a light of a one wavelength 
once they hit by a light of a uh, uh, given wavelength they go for an excitation state in excitation state they are unstable and they come to the ground state by emitting light of a different wavelength or a longer wavelength okay and this is called emission this is this property of a uh, is called fluorescence okay the the uh, the material which gives this is called fluorochrome okay and this property is called as fluorescence okay the substance which gives you is called fluorochrome and this property of emitting light is called fluorescence clear i'm talking about this okay now what happens in a flow cytometer so as i said to you the cell has to go cell has to be in suspension that is the cell has to be in a liquid or a fluid medium in a suspended state in a single in a it not not as an aggregate it should be in a single fashion okay and when it is flowing through a flow cytometer it has to flow in a single file pattern that is one after the other okay now second thing is that a focused laser beam will hit the cell okay and it scatters light as i said you what are the types of scatter forward scatter which will give you the idea about the size of the cell and then side scatter which gives you about the idea about the internal complexity of the cell then it, the same laser will hit the fluorochrome to which the cell is uh, when the fluorochrome start to the antibody and it emits fluorescence okay the emitted fluorescence is also filtered and collected okay now all this light signal from the scatter from the fluorescence these are all light right so this light will be converted to electronic digitalized values so electron photons are converted to electrons basically and after this electronic digitalized values are ready you need to interpret on a computer using a specialized software which is called interpretation so to make the cells pass in a single file pattern you need something called fluidics to have a light source you need a laser which is optics and you also need filters to collect the emitted light and the scattered light this filter also along with the laser is called combined as optics then you need uh, these photons are converted to electronics and you need electronics for it and finally a software which is called interpretation so these are the components of a flow cytometer so the second lecture will be dealing in detail about all these things okay so what are the components of a flow cytometer first is fluidics so what is its function the basic function of the fluidics is to make the cell pass in a single file fashion so you find cells are in aggregates here but when they pass through the flow nozzle it has to for it has to pass one by one or in a single file fashion which is done by fluidics okay second is optics where you have a laser beam which will hit the cell and the scattered light and the fluorescent light is collected by filtered by filters and lenses which is called optics and then the scattered light is converted to electrons by source of electronics which is third component which is electronics and finally a software to interpret the data okay so these are the components of a flow cytometer to make it simple so what are the components of flow cytometer you have fluidics i request the participant to mute them so somebody is mute okay okay so so what are the components of flow cytometer fluidics okay what is the function of fluidics to make the cell pass in a single file pattern second is light source which is commonly the lasers third is optics the optics are nothing but filters to filter the emitted scattered light and fluorescent light fourth is detectors where the photons or the light is converted to electrons electronics where the electrons will be converted to digitalized values and these digitalized values are analyzed by a flow cytometry software okay so these are the components of a flow cytometer so this gives you an overview of flow cytometer how it works so you have a cell sample and as it goes through the nozzle all the cells will pass in a single file pattern by means of fluidics okay so as they pass in a single file pattern one cell will be interrogated the laser will interrogate the cell one at a time so 
So this is very important. The laser will interrogate the cell one at a time. Okay. So when the laser hits the cell, as I said to you, two things happen. One is scatter, other is fluorescence. Okay. Scatter lights is 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 all collected, and even the fluorescence light is collected with the help of filters. Okay. These filters, and then the collected light is converted to electrons. The electrons are con converted to digitalized values, which is interpreted in the software. So these are the components of a flow cytometer. Okay. Again, a simple same experiment. So you have a light which is hitting the cell as well as the fluorochrome. So you have emitted fluorescence, which will be collected by the detectors, which will be given in the system, and it, it gives you the which has to be analyzed in the flow cytometer software. So as I, this one I already showed you. This is a forward scatter, side scatter plot. Now you can able to discriminate the population. This is lymphocyte, monocyte. Neutrophils. Now, why I showed you that? See, normally in flow cytometry, we use this term called event cluster population. So, what are these? See, every dot what you are seeing is a event. Every event what you see is a cell. So, this is a representation of one cell data. Okay, so this is not just a dot. This is one cell which is being represented as a dot. Okay. So when you have like cells, for example, all the lymphocytes will have fall in this location. So you find lot of dots in this area. So all the lymphocytes or like events will fall in one particular place and they form a small cluster. Okay, this is called population. Okay, when I call this, I will call that this is a lymphocyte population. Similarly, monocytes, since they are all, they have same physical properties. Okay, they all fall. In this area, and I call this as a monocytic population. And similarly, this one I call as neutrophilic population. Okay, so I repeat: every dot is a what you see in a dot plot in a flow cytometry plot. Every dot is a event, and every event corresponds to one particular cell. Like events fall at one particular area as a clustered popula clustered events, and they are called population. Clear? Any doubts? Any doubts? See, if you have doubts, please put it in the chat box. Okay. So this is a lymphocyte cluster, and uh, now we have our cells. Okay. Now I am talking about multicolor flow cytometer. I showed you an example with single particular antibody and antigen. Now let me show you something different. So we have a combination of cells. Okay. Take for example lymphocyte where we have T, B, and NK cell combination. And now I'm using antigen A tagged to a fluorochrome APC and antigen B, which is tagged to another fluorochrome called FITSI. These are all fluorochromes. Okay. So if you're not understanding these terms, FITSI, APC, don't worry. So I'll be discussing in detail about this in the subsequent lectures. Now I'm just showing an overview. Okay. So now I'm using an antibody to antigen A. For example, let, let me uh, give an example. Antigen A is CD4 and antigen B is CD8. Okay, we have CD4, which is tagged to a fluorochrome called APC, and we have antigen CD8, which is tagged to a fluorochrome FITSI. Okay, now adding these two antibodies conjugated to their respective fluorochromes, what happens? This will directly bind to cells expressing CD4 antigen, and this will bind to cells expressing CD8 antigen, correct? So once this is stained and processed in flow cytometer, you get a data like this. Correct. So you have this is y axis, this is x axis, and you have four quadrants drawn like this. Okay. So APC is tagged to CD4 on y axis, and FITC is tagged to CD8, which is represented on the x axis. Now you get four populations. So the population lying in this area, that is the left upper quadrant, it is positive only for CD4 tag to APC. Okay, it is negative for CD8. Okay, when you get a population lying in this quadrant, which is right bottom, this population is positive for only CD8 and it is negative for CD8, uh, CD4. Okay, so this is positive only for CD8 because it is the fixing only is positive. 
if you find a population falling here it is positive for both cd4 ap cd4 and cd8 okay similarly if you find a population in this quadrant that is bottom quadrant left bottom it is negative for both cd4 and cd8 so b lymphocytes nk cells all fall in this area okay so this is how you need to interpret a dot plot okay so i'm just giving you a overview every particular thing what i'm talking will be taken in detail in the subsequent lecture so if you're not understanding don't get panic okay so basically it's like interpreting a graph where you have x axis y axis population falling here is positive for both x axis marker and y axis marker population falling here is only positive for x axis marker population falling here is positive only for y axis marker and population falling here is negative for both x and y axis marker simple okay so this one i already discussed with you i'm sorry i'm just going back okay so sometimes when you talk with your friends colleagues people who are been as an observer or people who are using flow cytometer they commonly use this word color i have a four color flow cytometer i have a six color flow cytometer eight color 10 color 13 color what does this color mean basically the number of colors the machine denotes is is that the number of colors the machine can explore simultaneously for example if someone says they are having a four color flow cytometer which is outdated now if they have four color flow cytometer it means their machine can detect four colors at a given point of time so it means like they have four detectors which can detect four fluorochromes at a given point of time for example pitc pe ecd pc 5.5 these four are different different fluorochromes and these can be four can be detected at a given point of time okay so for example if someone has eight color flow cytometer that means they can simultaneously detect eight fluorochromes at a given point of time and similarly if you want to stain the cell a single cell can be stained by stained with eight different fluorochromes tag to different different antibodies for example if i want to study uh, lymphocyte subset analysis in a eight color flow cytometer at a given point of time i can use eight antibodies tag to different eight different fluorochromes i'll just give you an example cd19 fitc cd3 pe cd4 ecd cd8 pc 5.5 okay uh, cd7 apc okay cd5 uh, apc 700 so eight fluorochromes can be studied simultaneously whereas you cannot study the same in a four color cytometer because it has only capability to detect only four colors at a given point of time okay so colors means the number of fluorochromes you can use at a given point of time or the machine can detect at a given point of time okay hope you understand okay so this number of colors depends upon two things one is the number of lasers if you have only one laser one laser can maximum excite five fluorochromes so your machine can detect only up to five colors okay so if you are using two laser instrument then one laser can excite five fluorochromes the second laser can excite three or three three fluorochromes so totally it's a eight color instrument if you are using three lasers then the first laser blue laser can excite five fluorochromes second laser that is a red laser can excite three fluorochromes and the violet laser can excite five fluorochromes it can go up to 13 colors so the laser is one thing which also determines the number of colors your machine can de can uh, detect the other important one is the detectors for that particular emission okay only if i have 13 detectors i can detect all the 13 fluorescent emissions happening okay so i have three lasers if i have only four detectors it can detect only four signals correct so the colors of a flow cytometer depends upon the number of lasers as well as the detector channels which are present in the instrument okay so higher the number of colors greater the number of markers that can be simultaneously analyzed okay so as i said you if i want to do a lymphocyte subset analysis if i have a four color instrument i can use only four antibodies for example i need to use cd3 cd4 cd8 cd56 i cannot here use cd19 or cd45 or cd20 so cd7 these things i cannot use if i use a eight color i can use all in one given point of time that is advantage and who determines that that your instrument your instrument by by the number of lasers it has and the number of detectors it has it can the colors the machine uh, the number number of fluorochromes the machine can detect varies okay so now i'll ask you a simple question 
which is better instrument for detecting leukemia and lymphoma immunophenotype you want to use a four color instrument or a eight or ten color instrument anyone so eight or ten color instrument yes ten you need instrument. perfect you need to use a eight or a ten color instrument because see uh, in leukemia and lymphoma you need to use multiple antibodies that to flu multiple different fluorochromes at a given point of time so if you want to do in a four color instrument see you can do basically initially sometime back like 10 years back everyone was doing leukemia lymphoma by four color but it, it will take you large volume of sample you need to use so many tubes for example the first tube you need to use four color the second tube the other four color markers again you need to combine all these tubes with a backbone marker so by volume sample volume it is more by backbone markers you are wasting antibodies and that is a, and again you cannot simultaneously study all the combinations possible so four color is not a good idea for studying a leukemia lymphoma phenotypic whereas 10 color is much better you know because you can drop 10 different antibodies at one go and you can study different different combinations and you can isolate the population with confidence okay so i have some questions let me answer those questions 10 color 10 color good so very good super so it was answered to the question perfect so now so this is what we saw so there is some people take lot of pride in saying that uh, i use a 13 color instrument i use a 10 color instrument see but higher the number of colors there also arises a problem with compensation what is compensation lecture 4 i'll be discussing on it okay that is basically fluorescence spillover now i'm going to not going to go on to that okay so higher the number of colors greater the complexity arises because of fluorescence spillover and compensation okay so Multicolor detection is something like this. You have a cell where you have already two antibodies attached to it. So when it is hit by the laser beam, you get a plot like this. Okay. So this cell is here. It is positive for both FITC and PE signal because it has green and orange attached to it. Okay. So these cells will be falling in this place. For example, you take this cell. It has only the one particular fluorochrome attached to it, the green fluorochrome, which is these particular cells. Okay, and similarly, if you take uh, only red, this particular cell, it falls here. Okay, it has only this thing. Okay, so that is how we do multicolor flow cytometer. Now I have shown you two colors, but this can go up to 13 different colors I can use. So one cell stained with 13 different antibodies, and I can study 13 different combinations of this particular cell. So that is all about multicolor flow cytometer. Okay, correct. Now let's quickly go into the applications and we close the session today. We have five more minutes. Okay, so the basic applications of flow cytometry is in uh, leukemia lymphoma. If I ask someone like what is the application of flow cytometry, everyone first says leukemia lymphoma. Yes, of course, very commonly used uh, thing is leukemia lymphoma, but it is not restricted to that. It is also used very uh, widely in primary immunodeficiency disorders. Sorry, there is an error in the spelling. Primary immunodeficiency disorders for detecting lymphocyte subsets that is T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, NK cells, T helper cells, cytotoxic T cells, naive cells, memory cells, etc. THR assay for uh, CGD detection, leukocyte adhesion defects, activation assays, double negative T cells for diagnosis of autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome, viscot syndrome, HLH, interleukin release assay, etc. Of course, leukemia and lymphoma enough in adapting and uh, Minimal residual disease assessment post therapy after chemotherapy to check whether any residual disease is there. In transplant immunology, we do flow cross match and HLA antibody screening, stem cell enumeration, fetal maternal hemorrhage, PNH, platelet function disorders, immunotherapy, and in cell therapy. So the applications of flow cytometer also depends upon the capability of your flow cytometer. That's what I said. Use for in a simple experiment, you it's you can do it in a four or a five color flow cytometers. Such simple simple experiments are apoptosis, DNA ploidy and assessment of cell proliferation, HLA B27, stem cell enumeration, TB and K cell enumeration, PNH diagnosis, reticulocyte enumeration. Okay. See these three we'll be covering in the last part of this course. Practically, we'll be doing this, and you'll also be doing this. Okay. Of course, PNH uh, not a five color. You can do by five color, but I would suggest a six color minimum for a 
PNH diagnosis. And advanced experiments where you need an 8 or 10 or a 13 color instruments like leukemia lymphoma immunophenotype, MRD, minimal residual disease detection, interleukin and T cell activation assays, extended lymphocyte subset analysis. So all these needs are higher end instruments. Okay. Now let's quickly see the advancements in flow cytometer. So as I said to you, clinically, now currently clinically, most of the labs are using 13 color flow cytometers at the maximum. Of course, Tata Hospital is using a 16 color flow cytometer instrument, but the, uh, all others are using a maximum 13 color instrument. But if you see, for research, you can use up to, you can study up to 50 parameters. That is 48 colors. This is a 48 color flow cytometer, which is equipped with nine lasers and 48 detectors. Imagine in one cell, you can stain them with 48 different antibodies and you can explore all the 48 antigens in different different combinations so 48 into 48 different combinations you can study the cells so this is the highest one which is currently there in the market which is a nine laser 48 color instrument why they have put 50 is because 48 colors and the other two is forward scatter and side scatter that's why they call it as 50 parameter instrument okay but the color wise it's a 48 color instrument the highest of all Okay. The other advancement is cell sorting. What is cell sorting is, these are flow cytometers which are also have an added advantage to sort or separate the cells of interest. The normal and conventional flow cytometer, we do only analysis, correct? We analyze different, different subsets, different, different populations and uh, we give the report. But in research, if you want to isolate a population of interest, for example, I want to isolate only cytotoxic T lymphocytes then I will get that cytotoxic T lymphocyte and I will instruct the machine to sort this population. So this population will be collected in a separate test tube. So this population, this particular test tube will have only cytotoxic T cells. The, all other cells will be going to the waste. Only the cells of interest which you gated and instructed to collect will collect in a, get collected in a test tube. For example, in this case, as a, the example what I given is, cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Now, this cytotoxic T lymphocytes, they may use it for their research because they want to study only how that particular subset behaves in their research. They can collect that population of interest and they can study. That is the advantages of cell sorting. So, cell sorting is of two types. One is hybrid where you can do cell sorting as well as analysis in the same flow cytometer or it can be a simple cell sorter where you cannot do analysis but only sorting. Okay. However, the principle is same as that of a flow cytometer, which has an added advantage of collecting the cells of interest physically. Okay. Yeah, this is how it happens. So, the cells of interest will give a charge and they will be collected. Up. So, if you get and instruct the, instruct the machine to collect the cells of interest, it will get collected. This is called sorting. The other is imaging flow cytometer where we were seeing that data has only dots, correct? But now if you get and select those dots, they the morphology of them, not as good as what you see in microscope, but tentatively a morphology can be visualized. Okay, so see this is a population, a B cell population, B lymphocyte population as I get it and this is how it is looking. So it is, con it is consistent with the lymphocyte morphology Okay, and it is positive for IgM. So, I can also see the fluorescence which is there in the cell. Okay, so this is called imaging flow cytometer. The advantage is, see if I am suspecting that this could be uh, some population, I want to confirm that it is blast or it is neutrophil or it is some other cell, I can just again select this population and see the morphology. Blast will be slightly bigger in size, neutrophils will show lobulation and I can confirm that the population what I have selected or analyzing is correct or not by help of this dark field morphology, okay. So this is an imaging flow cytometry which is available in the market, which is image stream MK2 of Amnes company. So basically this differs from the conventional flow cytometer where in conventional flow cytometers we use, we have detectors, correct. Here they use cameras to collect the pictures, which will be shown as a dark field microscope image, bright field microscope image, sorry. Okay, the other fascinating aspect which has come now is FlowFish, which integrates flow cytometry with fluorescent in situ hybridization. Okay, now instead of just seeing the cell and analyzing the cell, 
you can also study the chromosomes which are present on the cell. See, this is a lymphocyte and I'm using a chromosome enumeration probe. Well, that to a fluorescent molecule. Okay. See, even the fish probes, fluorescent in situ hybridization probes are fluorescent molecules. And now your flow, flow cytometer has the capability to detect the fluorescence of these particular probes. And we are exploring that. So you find that this is a lymphocyte and it has two 12 chromosomes, which is matching. Okay, similarly you can find two two. This is normal cells. Okay, now you see here, this is again a normal con normal control where you find the lymphocyte and you find two chromosome signals. Two chromosome signals. Okay, now you find this one. This is a case of CLL. How I am saying this is a CLL because here it is a T lymphocyte which is expressing only CD3 and CD5 and negative for CD19. So this is a T lymphocyte, normal T lymphocyte. This is normal B cells, okay, where it is expressing CD90 and negative for T cell molecules, CD3 and CD5. Now, you see this particular neoplastic cell, which is expressing B cell marker CD19 and it is positive for CD5. So, this combination occurs in CLL or mantle cell lymphoma, correct? So, this is a CLL or a mantle cell lymphoma okay, cell, where it is expressing two 17 chromosome, but the 17p region in one chromosome is got deleted. It is only one signal. Actually, you should get two signals. Correct? When you have two, 17 uh, two copies of chromosome 17, you should get two copies of short arm of chromosome 17, this particular loci. But one loci has got deleted. Okay, so this is a case of CLL with TP53 mutation or deletion. Okay, so with flow, you can able to diagnose lymphoma as well as you can able to tell what is the chromosomal abnormality which is there. So this is the beauty of flow fish. Okay, so that is about. So we can also do flow in not only fluid or liquid samples, we can also do in solid tissue. For that, what we need to do, we need to disintegrate the solid tissue into single cell suspension and then we can do flow cytometry. Okay, so in lymph nodes, we do this. In lymph nodes, what we do, we take a fresh lymph node without putting them in formalin, we get it in saline, we tease them or we use a desiccator where a solid lymph node is converted to a single cell suspension and then we can do flow cytometry. Similarly, in bone marrow biopsy also you can do. But the point is the cell has to be in a single cell suspension and it should be uh, neatly done. Okay, so this is a desiccator where the lymph node or uh, solid tissues can be converted to single cell suspension and you can do flow in that. Okay, so as I said, flow, the one beautiful advantage of flow cytometry is studying the rare cells. If you want to study some circulating cancer cells, carcinocythemia, Okay, you want to study some rare circulating metastatic carcinoma cells, you can study it with flow cytometry. All you need to have is a reagent to capture the capture that cell. So if I said you, if it is expressing FCAP, then EP4, you need to have an antibody against that to characterize it. So in the WhatsApp group, I've shared you certain books, study materials. This is one book which is very, very basic. I would suggest you to start with this if you want to have some repeat reading material. I have also shared this particular link in the group. I will reshare it again. So just study with this. And if you want to study some good journal, this is a beautiful journal, Cytometry. Part A is about basics and how flow cytometers work. Part B is more about clinical flow cytometry. This will be very, very, very interesting. Okay. So any articles or you want to learn about flow cytometry, this cytometry part B will be very, very useful. So this is the journal I would suggest you for future use. Okay, so with that, I'll just conclude. Thank you. It's been a long lecture, but this is how it's going to be. Most of the lectures will be between one hour to one and a half hours. Okay, so get a good snacks, good grab a cup of coffee and uh, stay with me for one hour to one and a half hours. So any doubts you have, I'll take now. Okay, any doubts? Any doubts? You can raise your hands or uh, I can uh, unmute you so that we can discuss. No doubts? Crystal clear? Sorry, sir, can I ask something? Sorry? Sir, can I ask something? Please, you can. Sir, uh, I have one query, sir. Uh, like you said, like the, the pluribombs, like FITC and APC, 
ABC 700. So, uh, how do we select those? So, God, if That's I am uh, okay. using, sir. Uh, so, uh, sir. How, how, how to select the fluorochromes? Is that your question? So, how do, uh, how do I know, sir, which fluorochrome will be giving what color with which CD marker? Because you said that uh, anti CD will be bound to the fluorochrome and that will bind to the antigen which is present on the cell, the CD marker which is present on the cell. Correct. So, then how do I know uh, which fluorochrome? Will be tagged to which antibody and what will be the color which will that be that is active? like the see, see, see. that's all. See, uh, when you're buying the antibody, for example, you are buying an antibody against CD3, correct? While you're buying the antibody itself, you need to select that. See, now this is a very preliminary session, first session on introduction. I'll discuss all these things in antibodies. So, when you're buying the antibody itself, you need to buy an antibody with the, the fluorochrome you select. For example, I need an antibody against CD19 molecule. When I'm ordering that anti CD19, I will select to which fluorochrome it, shall, it, it has to be tagged. In the market, it will be available in all the fluorochromes which is there. Now I will select like I need anti CD19 tag to Fitzy. Or I will select like anti CD19 tag to P. It is up to you. You can select it based upon your panel designing. So, how do we do that? Means how do we know which uh, should be the fluorochrome of choice with which CD markers? Is there anything, any logical yeah, step? Nothing like that, nothing like that. See, uh, it's very, uh, I can just, I, I, anyhow, I'll be discussing this in antibodies. Uh, so, it's very early to uh, discuss all these things. But anyhow, it's, it's up to you who to decide upon it. For example, if you are using an, uh, if you want to study some antigens which are expressed in a low amount, you need to select a fluorochrome which is bright. Okay. And for example, you want to study an antigen which is abundantly present on the cell. For example, like CD3. Then I need to select a dimmer fluorochrome. Uh, don't get panic. I have a separate session for uh, antibodies, all the fluorochromes, everything. At that time, I'll disclose all these things. For now, don't bother much. Okay? Sorry. Basically, it's up to you to select. And the selection has certain uh, criteria which I'll discuss, uh, discuss with you on lecture 3. Which, which I'll be discussing on fluorochromes. Okay? Sir. Sir. Yeah. Is there any difference between scatter and cell counter and flow cytometer? Uh, yeah. So, basically, if you see, the scatter in uh, cell counter and flow is almost same. But in cell counter, uh, I would suggest, if you just take forward scatter and side scatter, the flow cytometry scatter plots are much better compared to the cell counter plots. Because... Flow is designed only for that. Cell counter, it's just an additional thing. Uh, the equipment and the filters are not that great in cell counters as compared to a flow cytometer. But if you just see it on an over, overview, both appear same. As I showed you, the same scatters what I showed you may be there in your cell counter also. The, uh, the side scatter is basically neutrophils have high side scatter, lymphocytes have low side scatter, and similarly forward scatter. It's same, it's same, more or less same, but uh, flow cytometry plots will be much more better than your uh, cell counter plots. Yeah, thank you. Very informative, thank you. Any other doubts? See, again, I'm repeating. If you, uh, the, when you get any doubts, randomly you get any doubt, don't hesitate. You push me a WhatsApp message, I would love to take it anytime. Okay, so doubts are very, very bad things. You should not keep it in your mind. You should immediately ask and clarify.